So what's the best advice I can give you if you're interested in breeding pigs? Don't even think about doing it. You should not breed pasture pigs. I'm breaking down to do something today that I'd hoped I would never have to do with our breeder pigs. But really, this is only part of the problem with farrowing pigs on pasture. We've been raising pigs on pasture now for almost seven years and we've been breeding them for almost five years. I've gotten extremely lucky with our first sets of breeder pigs and now we have some major problems. I've recently lost two complete litters of pigs and I have a feeling I'm about to lose six or eight more. But that's not even the most important reason for not breeding pigs on pasture. And here's why. Most people love the thought of seeing all these little piglets running around the farm. They like seeing pictures of them and their cute little noses and we like taking them to schools and showing them off and it's a lot of fun until it's not. But there's a much more sinister side to breeding pigs on pasture because for every cute piglet that you find, you may see dozens of dead ones. But to provide some context to why you shouldn't breed pigs on pasture, let me first explain the complexities of having pasture raised pigs to begin with. There are a lot of people who are trying to raise pigs on pasture and many times they'll have one or two in their backyard. And you'll even see people who will raise five or 10, maybe even 25 pigs at a time. Even in my short time of raising pigs, I've seen a lot of people start raising them and then stop raising them because they had problems with them. Either, either their costs were too high or many times what they assumed would be an easy thing of raising pigs turned out to be more problematic. Even though pigs are generally fairly healthy animals, they don't have a whole lot of predators, there are still the occasional health problems with pigs. There are a lot of reasons people raise pigs on pasture. Part of it is they want to be involved in producing their own food. Part of it is they want to avoid the chemicals, the feeds, the additives, and many other things that are in commercially produced pork. Maybe they can't find it, or maybe they want to raise it themselves so they'll know what's in their food. For some people, there are humane reasons. They don't want to see sows locked up in small gestation crates where they can't even turn around. They want these lively animals to have fun and have a good life before they're eaten and that produces even more problems. Many people that want to raise their own food also don't trust a lot of the health advice that they get from the USDA Food and Nutrition Department, Health Services, or many other agencies. Many of them don't want to eat meat from animals that, that have been raised in confinement, that have been force-fed sub-therapeutic antibiotics, not because the animals are unhealthy, but because the feeds that they're eating and their lifestyles will make them unhealthy. And I get those reasons. Part of the reason I started farming years ago was because I wanted to grow food that was nutritious for my body to help it heal. And many of the people who are raising livestock like this, they want to do it in such a way where there are no chemicals, no medications, no antibiotics, nothing else. It seems to me that the way we've raised livestock over the last several decades has created a lot of problems that are not necessary. And so we create drugs, living conditions, and many other things to help offset those problems that we've created. Come on, pigs. For example, by raising pigs in unhealthy environments where they cannot get away from their manure, where it's either not captured in carbon-based materials, or where it's not scattered out on a pasture for dung beetles and all to deal with. When it piles up and becomes anaerobic and stinks and fosters a whole lot of problems, you'll get a lot of parasite issues in those pigs. A similar thing happens with small ruminants like goats and sheep and even cows and chickens. As a result, you'll get a lot of people talking about natural remedies for keeping away parasites and livestock. In pigs, one of the most common that I hear about is pumpkins. They're a natural dewormer. I'm here to tell you that is a lie straight from the pit of you know where. Most of those issues are grounded in just a little kernel of truth. Like pumpkins have some natural anti-helminth properties. So does chicory, so does plantain, and other forbs. You see, here's the thing. I'd be willing to bet that I've fed more pounds of pumpkins per pig in a smaller amount of time than most people in the United States. I fed over 40,000 pounds of pumpkins to a group of eight breeding pigs. That is a lot of pumpkins. The pigs were pooping orange they were eating so much. And yet, one of those sows lost all but one of a litter of piglets that she had because the parasite loads were so high just less than a month after feeding all those pumpkins. I'll talk more about worming and parasite issues in another video. I just bring it up to say that people look for a lot of natural remedies, some may help, 
like pumpkins and chicory, but they may not be the complete answer. People look for a lot of natural remedies, and as a result, they take hold of that and just run with it. They'll hear people say things like, you know what, I fed pumpkins to my pigs, and I'd never had worming issues. And based on my experience, if you have feeder pigs that are wormed when you get them, and you rotate them every couple weeks throughout their processing weight, chances are you won't have any significant parasite issues in those pigs. But when you start breeding pigs on pasture, it turns into a whole other problem. Perhaps one of the more significant issues with raising pigs on pasture, whether they're feeder pigs or whether they're breeders, is that it's hard to get any kind of good medical advice about them. The Mississippi State Veterinary School is 40 minutes from my farm. My dad's a retired veterinarian, still practices a few hours a month, and his practice did large animal work when they first started. And he's helped me out a lot with our pigs from time to time. But there are some issues related just to pigs that he's not familiar with. And the funny thing is even though the vet school will have swine people there, none of them are familiar with raising pigs on pasture. All the advice that you get from state extension agencies, most of that is gonna come from a system where they raise pigs in confinement in barns. The issues there are very different than the issues you deal with in pastured pigs. It's hard to get a lot of the medications that livestock farmers usually could get quite easily. They could go to Tractor Supply and get some of the cheaper, less effective antibiotics. Now you've got to have a prescription for those antibiotics. That's a separate issue in itself, and there's just not a whole lot of resource to help you with pastured pigs. If you're going to raise some weaned feeder pigs on pasture to go to the market, chances are you won't have a whole lot of issues with them. They're easier to manage, and there are some people around who are knowledgeable that will help you out. Unless you're in one of these rare areas, you might have a difficult time getting proper veterinary care. But when you're breeding pigs, it is a whole different story. Let me explain why. If you're raising pigs on pasture, you're gonna have some good advice and some bad advice and sorting through what's good and what's bad is gonna be incredibly difficult. You might not be fortunate enough to have people who actually know what they're doing. But when you start breeding pigs on pasture, you are going to have a heck of a mess to deal with, a huge learning curve, that'll cost you a lot of money. And here's why. For the last several decades, most pigs have been bred for confinement operations. And then you've got a group of pigs that are raised for breed standards, and those breed standards are often very, very different, many times opposed to what you're doing on your farm. And then you'll have a lot of pigs that are raised for show pigs, and show pig genetics and meat pig genetics are not the same at all. Most importantly, and unfortunately, the pigs that are raised in any of those environments are rarely going to be raised to produce good mothers. Why should you have good mothering instincts when you have sows in gestation crates that won't lay on their piglets? We breed for pigs that are slowly sitting down so they don't squash their piglets. Many meat pig genetics are raising pigs based on how many piglets they produce and not whether the boar's genetics or the sow's genetics produce good milk for the future. I was fortunate to acquire good Berkshire Duroc hamster type genetics, but as I've tried to increase the genetic diversity in our herd, it has been incredibly difficult to find good mothering instincts plus good meat pig genetics. You see, I'm raising pigs for meat. I don't care about breed standards. I want them to produce good carcass, good value for our customers. I want them to forage well so that their meat quality is good, but also so that it reduces my feed costs. But most importantly, every single one of our sows must have good mothering instincts. They should wean high numbers of piglets. They shouldn't be squashing piglets. They should produce good milk. They should make their own nests, and they should be able to do all that and take care of their babies. I've had some really good genetic lines of pigs that just had their babies out in the middle of nowhere and abandoned them without showing any kind of maternal instinct. Good genetics and breeders mean absolutely nothing if those sows aren't weaning their piglets. So I'm in the livestock trailer sorting out our breeder pigs and vaccinating them to solve our current problem. The main problem that we're dealing with is either lepto or parvo and I'm not sure which one. Uh, both of them are diseases that impact only the reproductive systems in the pigs. Frankly, I've never had experience with either one of them until now. The problem reared its ugly head when I had two gilts that ferret a few weeks back. They made beautiful nests in the pasture. Uh, the mothers needed no help farrowing at all. Uh, and each gilt had one live piglet when I found it. But both of those piglets died two or three days after they were born. I know one of them was nursing 
Uh, the other one was a little bloated, and I suspect it had some kidney problems. There were other piglets in each litter. Uh, they were not fully formed, and most of them it looked like were born dead. The entire breeding group of these pigs, I think, are going to have problems. I think it's the porcine parvo, but it could be the lepto. Fortunately, the treatment is the same for both of them. Uh, you vaccinate them prior to breeding. The, the first time you vaccinate them, uh, you vaccinate them five weeks before breeding, and then two weeks before breeding, you give them the second dose. Subsequent breedings, you only have to give them one single dose. Unfortunately, because this vaccine can't be saved, and it's supposed to be used in just a few hours of opening. Uh, this is part of the problem with pigs. It's learning to manage them well. The threshold is much higher for breeders, especially when you don't have uh, that much assistance from experienced veterinarians or extension agents who are used to dealing with pigs on pasture. There really are a lot of reasons you shouldn't ferret pigs on pasture. Part of it is you're not going to get the support that you're going to need. If you're raising 40 to 50 pigs a year to market weight on pasture, it might be worth ferreting your own pigs. Realistically though, you're going to be much better off um, purchasing the pigs even if you're paying 100 150 200 dollars per piglet at least once you once you get your breeding system done your cost of breeding will come down but the costs really are quite high if you've raised several dozen pigs over several years on pasture to market weight it may be worth farrowing your own there's a huge learning curve and it's best to get your feet wet uh, by raising feeder pigs grow them to market weight sell them process them sell the meat however you're going to do that once you've done a hundred or more of those pigs then it might be worth farrowing pigs on pasture but i'm just here to tell you there's a huge learning curve you're going to have to think critically you're going to have to think analytically and you're going to have to see through the bull and there are a lot more issues when you have pigs on your farm year round compared to when they're just on the farm uh, for a few months out of the year y'all take care have a great day